you know, my gambling addiction started really out of my poker addiction. You know, when I was 18 or 19 years old, my friends and some family members were playing online poker, and I was really excited to play with them, you know. I remember playing card games around the poker table, around the kitchen table, rather, uh, when I was a kid. Games like, you know, Follow the, Follow the Queen and, and, and Spades and different things, and I was always really fascinated by the card game you know it was always something that I appreciated more than you know playing Scrabble or something right but uh, when I got older and they were playing for money it wasn't a lot of money it was just like these little five dollar tournaments online it was a brand new thing the internet you know it sort of opened up the door for opportunities to play poker uh, with a lot of people at the same time and the poker boom happened a few years later and that's where I was that's where I got stuck sort of in the middle I was in the right place at the right time essentially and it was uh, my fascination with being able to bluff and and beat people at their own game that really fascinated me you know as soon as I stepped in the casino for the first time in Las Vegas and the smoke was in the air and these guys had their sunglasses on I mean it was such an, an incredible experience for me as someone who had played online poker for so long but experiencing it in real life really turned my heart towards seeing something that I could see myself doing for a long time and I just really wanted to engulf myself in that atmosphere and I did so when I came back to St. Louis uh, I ended up playing you know, poker at the local casino, playing little cash games and poker tournaments and things like that. Eventually, I got a job dealing poker, and it became this habit of, you know, dealing poker or uh, playing poker or sleeping. <laughs> and, and I eventually gave up all my relationships, my friendships, my uh, uh, anything that would keep me from being at the casino. Uh, it took up all my time. Every single minute of my day was devoted eventually to being at the casino and spending my paychecks at the casino and you know, you know the habit of addiction, you know, uh, you spend until you don't have any more, you try to recover, right? Anybody been there? Uh, me. Uh, you try to recover and then maybe you recover a little bit. Maybe you even have a, sh a short period where you're like, I can beat this, I can do it. But eventually you get turned around and you end up, end up back there. It's what happened to me over and over again for 10 years. But my sports gambling addiction came out of that really because in the midst of me trying to overcome one of my poker problems, right, I was introduced to sports betting because I had signed myself off some of the casinos in Missouri. So sign off, it means that uh, uh, there is a, a program called DAP or Disassociated Persons, at least here in Missouri, and where you can go into a casino and you can sign yourself off and you can say, okay, hey, I have a problem gambling and I want you to help me uh, not go back here, not spend my money at this casino. And if you see me on your property, you have permission to arrest me for trespassing. And so it's a, it's a deterrent really to help people like I was stop gambling and maybe some of you know of this program or a similar program in your area i had done that right i had signed myself off the casino although it didn't stop me right i ended up driving to other states i ended up doing things uh gambling in other ways and sports betting was the number one of that i was introduced through <laughs> really at, at the poker room you know you talk to people and some of the people there were bookmakers and some of them were just betting on sports you know here and there and so i got involved in this world i was introduced uh to betting by a friend of mine who taught me sort of how to do it what the over under was what the spread was what that meant and i because i was i was naive i was like well you just bet on the best team every time you're going to make a million million bucks right but it was of course then it was uh, explained to me about how odds work and how if you're betting the favorite uh it, it costs you more money to win less and all all these things were explained to me and i'm i'm fascinated by it because it, again it turns into my my poker nature right like i think i can beat this i think i have the skills to do this i think i can beat this system right Anybody been there? So this was my story. And I got down this rabbit hole. The first game I ever bet was the local team. And I remember uh, one of the bookies that I worked with told me, don't ever bet for the home team against the home team at a, an event you're going to, because you don't want 40,000 people rooting against your bet. And that's always stuck with me. And, but I think <laughs> is, I wish he would have told me, you know what, John, don't go to a game and bet on it if that's the only way you can enjoy it because that's what it turned into for me i could i wasn't even really a sports fan before i started betting sports it, it became a a habit it became uh my priority when i realized that i could continue to bet on sports even if i couldn't play poker so if i wasn't allowed to go to the poker room and i didn't have the time to drive to a, a neighboring state or a few states away to go and gamble i could invest uh my paychecks into sports gambling so i became you know, a professional sports gambler. And essentially, you know, I, I became invested in this world so much. I began reading and listening and studying all the games and the players and learning about the rules and, and the weather reports. And I was totally engrossed in this. And eventually this became my number one habit because the bookies, unlike the poker room, 
when I had to go gamble at the poker room, I had to bring cash money in my wallet, you know, pull that wallet out, throw some, you know, 20s and hundreds on the table. But, but, uh, these, uh, bookies, at least back in the day, you know, they, they let you bet on some credit. And they even gave me a special phone number. You had to call in, uh, yeah, sports betting. And you have to be like, you give them your name and your password. Yeah, this is uh, uh, John Simmons. And my password is, you know. And I remember it, feeling so secretive about it. And it was like uh, such a, a unique experience. And it really it really added to the allure and the uh, the drive for me to want to keep betting on games. It, it felt so, it, it, it was like it was like a mixture of like something to do mixed with the thrill of trying to win something, mixed with the fact that I could do it uh, from the comfort of my own home, the fact that I could drink while I was doing it, I could do it with friends, the fact that I could do it while nobody was watching me. Now, when I was playing poker all the time, I lost all my friendships, my relationships, because I was at the casino so much. This was an event that I could get involved with and still be around people. Now, at this point, most of the people that I hung out with were, uh, you know, coworkers from the casino who had similar lifestyles as me or at least similar habits or, so, or they didn't care that I was into these sort of behaviors. So it, it became a little less uh, judgy, right? You know, when, you, when you're gambling and you've lost all your money, your, your family looks at you differently, but your coworkers who work at you at the casino necessarily don't look at you that way. So I'm just trying to share how sports gambling became uh, a part of my life. And it really did for years and years. I would bet on sports. Uh, I remember the first bet I made was $30. I remember the biggest bet. I, the first big bet I made was a $500 game on the Patriots. And, uh, I lost that bet and it was the most devastating thing that's ever happened to me. But I said, you know what? I can bet. I can, they lost by like just a, a few points. And I knew I was like, I was so close. I was so close. I can do this. I can do this. And so I just continued to up the at Annie and, and, you know, and eventually it turns into, you've, you've seen these memes before and you maybe you can, you know, recognize that, uh, sometimes it turned into, uh, betting things I didn't know nothing about, even though I'd studied the, the scouting report and I knew if the quarterback's girlfriend left him that weekend, if he was going to play bad or, you know, I, I knew that if they had won the championship game, they usually get drunk the night before and they send all the scrub players out the next game and they always have the, the lines are wrong. Like I had learned all these things, but eventually I just continued to get deeper and deeper into whatever was going. And so instead of just betting baseball or football, whatever's on prime time, I wanted to bet what's the day game what's the morning game and when there weren't any games in the morning you know you had to feed your habits so you find things that are going on you know you start betting overseas matches look he bets on the bulls and the Sox, the cubs he bet on the hawaii game only degenerates bet on the hawaii game i don't want that for you man soccer matches i've never even seen a soccer game before and here i was betting on you know the english premier league at eight in the morning on a monday uh to to fill my time, you know, and, and March Madness come around and I'd bet every single game on the board. That's hundreds of games. Like, what am I really trying to expect? It was just the habit of doing it. It became this uncontrollable urge that I had to have money on the line. It was not fun for me unless there was money on the line. And eventually it just became too much. I had filed bankruptcy at 22. I continued to lose money. Uh, all my paychecks were nearly uh, spent before I even got them. It, you know, whether I owed it to the bookie or if for some reason I got paid and I didn't owe any money to the bookie, or maybe I had won, you know, and I'd drive to a neighboring casino and, and lose it all in a few hours and have to drive back. And I'd be so depressed and, and so frustrated, yelling at my windshield, you know, couldn't believe that I'd gotten myself into this predicament again for the hundredth time I had lost everything. It was really no way to live. You know, 10 years of that, I put on all this weight, uh, lost uh, all my close friends, a lot of family had uh, broken relationships with me, and it was just so hard. It was so hard to continue down that life and that roller coaster. You can see here, uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures of me. This is me at the racetrack. You can you see my lifestyle, smoking, drinking, sitting around the racetrack. Now, the racetrack wasn't really my, my cup of tea necessarily, you know, uh, neither was the lottery. But it was a thing that I did. And, uh, you know, back then, you couldn't hardly find a picture of me. You know, it wasn't like the iPhone era of today. You know, I would just go and get drunk and hide myself from the world when I was losing, you know. But, uh, you see, there's really the entire period I was in my addiction. You can't hardly find a picture of me. And if you can find one, I wasn't smiling at it. Uh, depression had really taken hold of my life. And I was, at the end of my rope, I'd gone to counselors. I'd been a psychiatrist. I got, uh, diagnosed with some sort of OCD. They'd put me on medication to try and curb my addiction and it did. Uh, but it also made me not want to get off the couch. <laughs> I didn't want to do anything with my life, uh, gamble or otherwise, uh, counseling sessions where I, I poured my heart out and tried to get to the cause of the problem. Problem was I never really thought I was 
uh, a problem gambler. I thought that I was just having bad luck and that if any point I would just win, you know, the big bet or I could win that big parlay or I could win that big poker tournament that I would turn my life around, that everything would get better. Uh, people would be envious of all the money that I had and be jealous of the life. John lives in Las Vegas and he's gambling for a living. Like what a cool life. He doesn't have to, he just gets up and whenever he wants and goes wherever he wants and does all these cool things and gets to drink while he's working. Like I, I all those thoughts were in my head and sports betting was a big part of that. You know, it's a, it was something to do every day to keep my addiction going. And that's really what spiraled me out and out and out of control for so long is that uh, I found something besides poker that really fed that addictive nature of like, Hey, there's another game right now. Hey, there's another game right now. Hey, there's another game right now. Hey, there's another game right now somewhere in the world. And you could always have something to sweat. You know, we would even bet on monopoly. I couldn't do anything without betting. It was so deep inside me, but eventually I ran out of money. Uh, I ran out of options. I'd gone to GA meetings so many times, heard all, uh, all the stories of people who had been stuck on slot machines and different things. Never heard a story like my own. Never heard somebody say, you know what? I, I have been betting sports and I've lost everything and I can't get out of it. And that's why I'm making a video like this because maybe you're somebody, you know, maybe you started playing fantasy sports. It got out of control. Maybe you started, uh, you know, betting a local team and it got out of control like I did. It did with me. And so I just want to encourage you that there is a way to get out for me. It happened uh, at the end of a bender. I was uh, I did 90 days clean in a GA facility. Uh, I, it wasn't an in-person facility, but I was going to counseling s sessions there. And I had done 30 days clean. I had done 60 days and 90 days. And I remember getting my little certificate and him being like my, one of my counselors, uh, you know, uh, we're only going to celebrate now year by year. And I remember just being so upset by that because I had done 90 days clean, but at no point did I stop thinking about gambling. I'd done 90 days clean while I was thinking about gambling all the time. I was thinking, don't gamble, don't gamble, don't gamble. And I was putting things into my life to help me to stop doing that. So I would like smoke a million cigarettes or I would take naps or I'd work overtime or eat a bunch of food or, you know, binge a movie or like, I, I, I just filled my life with stuff to try and overcome that thought that was always in my mind. Go gamble, go bet on a game go, go call your bookie. Like all those and doing 90 days clean was such hard work. It was so hard. It was so hard. Daily meetings, daily phone calls, the serenity prayer a thousand times. It was so hard to stay sober. And when he said we, we weren't going to celebrate anymore. It was the first time I paused in, in that season of trying to get recovery. Cause I was like, no, I need this. I need this constant praise and honor. I need someone to tell me that I'm doing it right. I, cause it's so hard for me to do it by myself. I need you. I need these people. I need these meetings to tell me you're doing the right thing. And, and I said, how come the desire to gamble has never gone away? And I just remember him saying the desire is never going to go away. You just need to learn to live one day at a time, 15 minutes at a time, repeat the serenity prayer when you're having struggles. And for me, that, that felt like the most terrible life I could live because it was so hard to stay clean. At that moment, I was like, you know what? I'd rather gamble and deal with those consequences than to have to live a life where the only thought in my head was don't gamble. It didn't sound like a life that I really wanted to live. So I left that gambling center. I went on a bender. I sold everything in my house, all the money, anything that wasn't tied down. Uh, and I just bet as much as I could, as fast as I could. And eight days later, I bet a Giants, uh, uh, Giants Jets game, uh, Monday night game, and I lost. It was the last dollar that I had, that I really had. Like, I mean, I had nothing left, no friends, no money, no nothing. And at that moment, I was like, well, I guess this is it. It's time for me to take my life because there's just no point in waking up tomorrow. And I remember thinking about, you know, taking all the pills in my house or driving my car into a wall. A friend of mine who I worked with at the casino had recently killed himself by jumping off a bridge. I had seen many people in my circle of coworkers and friends commit suicide. So it wasn't like this. It was this crazy idea. It was just like, it's my turn. And so I had all these thoughts. And before I did anything, I just remember going in my bedroom and it was dark. And I sat on the edge of my bed and I said, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And, and I was just thinking, maybe I'll pray. You know, I didn't really pray ever as an adult. And 
I just looked up at the ceiling. I said, God, if you're real, I need you to show me a future and a hope for my life. I just don't see one anymore. But I was so desperate for it. And in that moment, I heard the words, the kingdom of heaven is upon you. The kingdom of heaven is upon you. And I thought I was going crazy. thought I was going nuts because the depression and the suicidal thoughts that I was having. thought I was hearing voices. I'd never heard this expression, the kingdom of heaven is upon you. And I ran to the other room. And I felt compelled to open this Bible that was on my bookshelf. Now, I had never opened it. It belonged to my dad. The only reason I had it was my dad's Bible. And it was given to me when he passed away. And I didn't feel like I could throw it away. So I just kept it on my bookshelf forever, never opened it. And that night I opened it. And I opened it up uh, to the first page of the New Testament. And I just started reading in a few paragraphs down and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is upon you. And I just remember sort of crying. I felt this warmth over my body that I can't explain. I was just like, I think God's real. I think he's talking to me. Now I have no reason to believe that. No reason to think that. No reason to understand that because I had never been taught that. I never seen that. Never heard of such a thing. But that's exactly what happened to me. And in that room by myself with no one around, I started reading this Bible this book of Matthew talking about how Jesus had died for my sins and it was the first time that I was like oh my gosh I've just been doing everything wrong my whole life just been doing things my way been gambling I, so I started crying out, Lord forgive me I don't know I just been I just did it all wrong I, this isn't the life that I wanted to live I thought I'd be something different at this point I can't believe I can't stop I need your help forgive me and I just literally felt I mean, it's, I, I use the word literally in this situation because I just felt the weight start crumbling off of my shoulders. I was just, I felt so much peace in that moment. Like, all right, like I, something's going to change. Something's about to change. And it did. It did. It didn't happen overnight, but I continued to go down that relationship with Jesus, reading my Bible, eventually ended up at a church, eventually ended up meeting some people who, uh, discipled me. But I kept asking God to take this addiction from me. And there were times I would walk into the casinos and my stomach would feel heavy. My feet would feel heavy. I'd get these knots so big. Oh, it's just like I'm sick to my stomach for even walking in. God put a physical conviction on me to stop going to the casinos. And then as I was watching games, I felt sick to watch them. And, but I wanted to bet him and I would bet him anyway. And I would just cry and I would be upset. And it'd be my, it, it's like doing everything you can to do something wrong and you're just you're swimming like upstream and it's so hard and you got like weights on your ankles and you can't really do it. you're doing it but you're not really doing it and you don't, you don't really like doing it you want to stop you want to and after about six months god just delivered me a lot of prayer a lot of asking god to heal me I made my last sports bet in april of 2013 and i've been clean ever since eventually god showed me that he had a plan for my life. That was the first time I'd ever heard something like that, you know, uh, at a church service I went to. In the history of my gambling, a lot of people would tell me like, hey, you're crazy for gambling. Uh, you're stupid. Why don't you just stop? You know, you're losing all your money. And if it was that easy to stop, I would have stopped. But I was searching for something in my life. I wanted to be this thing. I wanted to be this poker turn. I wanted to be Chris Moneymaker. I wanted to be, you know, shark betting these games. But when I found out God had a plan for me, that switched something in my mind. And this is really how I stopped. Is when I found God's plan for me. And it helped me run towards the future he had for me. And run away from the past that I was living in. Because if you don't have a future to walk towards, you'll always turn around and go back to where you came from. And I didn't want to go back there anymore. And I don't know if you want to go back there anymore. Maybe you don't. I always tell people, look, you know, I just want to get you help. I don't know what help you need, but I know that there is something better out there for you because I was lonely, depressed, frustrated. I was about to kill myself. I had lost all my money and then some, and then my friend's money and then my family's money. I had lost it all, man. I had a job I didn't like. I lived in a place I couldn't barely afford to pay for. People were constantly bailing me out. I, I I was overweight. I mean, if, if there's a negative thing that could have happened in my life, I lost my fiance. If there was a negative thing that could have happened in my life, it happened pretty much. But now I look back at that guy and I hardly remember him. 
since the time Jesus came into my life and I felt that peace and I prayed and I asked for help. Everything changed. Everything changed. God gave me a plan for my life that I started to chase after. God eventually showed up with a wife who looked at my past and goes, God's, I don't even know who that guy is. I know who you are now. And I feel like I've been, I feel like I started over. I feel like I got a fresh lease on life. I just celebrated my 10 years of being a Christian a few weeks ago. And I really feel like I've only been alive 10 years because all that stuff beforehand didn't matter. Uh, it was not only was I forgiven of it by Jesus, but I've been able to move on in my life and now use what I had in those years to help people today. And so I want to encourage you today. It's not over. Whatever you're going through is not the end. There is absolutely something better out there for you. I want you to find it. I hope you find it through Jesus, but I also just hope for you to get help regardless of who or where or how God has a plan for your life. But even if you don't believe in God at this moment, there's still an opportunity for you to have hope for your future because I don't want you to end up where I was. I don't want you to end up in a place where you want to kill yourself. You think your life is meaningless. It's not. You are not meaningless. I was not meaningless. I felt meaningless, but I wasn't. And so how did I stop gambling? I first cried out to God. I found a plan from him for my life and I chased after it with everything and I didn't look back. What does that look like for you? Maybe you've tried counseling. Maybe you've tried psychiatry like I have. Maybe you've been to all the GA meetings. Maybe you've given your debit cards over to friends and family so you don't spend it anymore. Maybe you tried everything you could. Maybe these fantasy sp sports sites just continue to lock you up. You've got all the apps on your phone. You've spent all the 401k money. Whatever the thing is, there is still a chance to redeem what's been lost. Not financially necessarily, even though I believe you can make all that money back to redeem the life you lost the time you've lost the friendships you've lost the tears you've suffered and cried the prayers you've sent up to god even if you didn't really know what you were saying you just cried out in your car while screaming at the windshield i need help there can be help for you so i'm going to pray with you now and i hope that things get better and i believe they can heavenly father i want to reach out through this camera through anybody who's watching this today if they're like i was lord i know how desperate it can feel to feel so empty and alone and pitiful and angry and frustrated the bet didn't the bets never work i know what it's like to scream and scream and scream but i also know what it's like lord to hear your voice and i know what it's like to find the truth which is that you sent your son for us and for me and for this person and that death on the cross and resurrection gives us access to freedom from our gambling addiction so lord i pray that anybody who would cry out to you tonight or this morning or is hearing this prayer and is, is asking for help lord i pray you would come to them right now let them experience lord the warmth of the holy spirit that i experienced Help them hear the voice of God like I did. Help them open up a Bible and understand that the word of God, which everybody says is outdated and it's just a book of rules and it's for old people. Let them experience what I did was that it's a real word for them. Life changing words. I pray that anybody who is under the thumb of addiction, I pray that the enemy would be defeated. Those chains would be broken. That any prayer request to get set free from a gambling addiction would be heard in heaven and 10,000 angels would come Lord to, to, to help them tear them away from that part of their life send friends some family send support help them find a community Lord that will pick them up from the bottom they feel like they're sitting in and bring them to a place where they're seated at your feet where you're just going to rub their head Lord and tell them everything's going to be alright it's going to be alright Lord so I pray for them and I pray for me, Lord, even that none of us would be tempted to go back to that life, that we would only want to look forward to the plans that keep us out of that past. May you forgive us of trying to do things our way. Help us see your way and give us the faith we need, Lord, to walk it out. In Jesus name.
Amen. Guys, I want to thank you for watching. If you watch this far, I'm really up for you. We're going to be doing more podcasts uh, on the subject, breaking down different subjects of sports gambling, encouraging you with different stories. I know this was a long video today of just me sharing my story, but I thought it was important to start this way because we don't know uh, what we don't know. And I want you to know that there are people out there who are like you, like me, feeling like it's never going to get better, but it can get better. And so... Uh, keep an eye out for this on the Testimony House Network. Subscribe to the channel. And until next time, guys, I hope and pray that you discover a future and a hope for your life today.